fave mentors. Dang it. Awesome. All right. Well, so we're actually streaming live on Facebook. This is a little impromptu Vapeneur of the Week episode with Chris Price. I ran across Chris on Quora, actually. He awesome. wrote a all right, he wrote a very guys. interesting um, he wrote a very interesting article about propaganda um, on Quora. I recommend you check it out. I'll post the link in the chat. Um, and uh, what I found most interesting about it was he broke down some very very salient points and very very uh, interesting points about what propaganda actually looks like and how it's executed. And when you start reading through these things, you start seeing the obvious connections of. Uh, propaganda and what they're doing to us in the vape industry and it turns out well no surprise he actually is very much experienced with the vape industry he was a manager he was just telling me he's a manager at the uh at the e-cigarette forum or he was involved with the e-cigarette forum for a while there so um chris uh, uh we're live man tell us tell me a little bit about your background and how this all got started and what you know about propaganda and your uh, experience at ecf and everything sure okay jesse yeah um uh, about 2009, um, I got uh, into um, the job of running ECF for, uh, via Oliver Kershaw, the owner of the site. And uh, at that time, that was kind of the main place for the vaping community. And uh, a lot of, also a lot of um, academics, doctors and so on, used to um, take part in that. Day. So it was kind of... Uh, an interesting site, an interesting forum, because you had the vaping community and also a lot of um, academics and so on, who, who um, Oliver uh, helped to um, get involved with it, with it all. So um, that's, I, that's really when I got interested in propaganda, because I, I could see straight away that that's what, one of the biggest problems we had. Was, so I'd been in, uh, involved a bit with various kinds of community politics before this. And then um, when we got involved with vaping, it was clear that uh, we had a fight on our hands. And uh, the, the huge amount of money in the USA propping up the um, smoking economy, cigarette sales, um, w w was a big factor in... Um, creating the propaganda that we were we were faced with. Yeah, so you were seeing this all the way back in uh, what what year was that when you were working for ECF? From two thousand and nine, so coming up for ten years ago. What was the first like indication that you saw and you you and you immediately and recognized it? What was that thing? Well, uh, what they what they were doing was they they were slow off the mark. They they'd shut down. Snus, Swedish snus sales in, in Europe and um, they did that easily because there was no community uh, back then to support THR. So when vaping started, they were very slow off the market, it was like they were asleep. Uh, the community uh, got quite well built up before they caught on to the fact that they had a fight on their hands and it was going to be much harder for them to shut us down it had been to shut snooze down in Europe. And so uh, what we were seeing first was junk science being churned out and a huge amount of opposition in the media from uh, US academics and uh, at that time global, global academics. So um, a lot of it was in the same kind of vein as... Uh, They'd already been shutting out with the secondhand smoke the ETS um, issue in the past, which was not really based on all the facts. A lot of the stuff that was coming out wasn't factual. And so you know, the same people, the front groups working for the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry, they were, the, they were the spokesperson for that uh, opposition to vaping in the first place. You know, the, the American insert body part here association, all those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. They were very well funded. There's a lot of money going into it. So uh, we realized we had a fight on our hands. And 
the money that's gone into the propaganda uh, campaign has increased year on year, I think. So you, somebody told me that, uh, Michael McFadden told me that he thinks there's as much as 500 million a year going into various kinds of um, their, their efforts in various areas. So there's a lot of money behind it there. Well, yeah, and I know that there's an article about the um, amount of money awarded to um, an ad, ad agency that basically runs all the truth about tobacco ads. Um, it's in the, I th it was in definitely in the hundreds of thousands, I want to say hundreds of millions too, um, where they are just, you know, money from the government just for this one ad agency. And obviously it's going to be a biased opinion because it's, they're supporting the truth, truth about tobacco, um, you know, movement. Um, and so, so, you know, what, what do you know about, you know, how do these, how do these groups, you know, how, how do they use those funds and how are they, uh, getting those funds and then and then turning it around and just running basically whatever biased ad that they can do. I mean, can you know about the, the structure of those types of groups and how those are kind of operating? Yeah, it, it, it's not that hard to work out. In 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 the early years, the 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 first opposition came from the tobacco industry, from the cigarette trade, and then um, they they gradually uh, figured out that they were wasting their time because we were too well organized and we were going to take, we were going to eat their lunch, whatever they did. So they gradually um, became less vocal about opposition to vaping. And uh, we found out why in the end, because they bought up a load of patents and they'd started um, marketing um, beginner e six mini e six um, themselves. So they, the opposition from the tobacco industry, or more correctly, the cigarette trade, um, slowed down and it was taken over by the pharmaceutical industry. They, they were and still are the main proponents. And they, um, they fund a lot of national groups, government groups such as um, CDC, uh, FDA, um, NIH. They're, they're so deeply involved with those um, organizations, you could say that they're pretty much one and the same thing in, in this area. And um, so we saw the tobacco, the cigarette trade drop out of opposition. The last to go were Imperial Tobacco when they bought up a load of patents and also took on the services of um, Hun Lee or Hun Lee is often called. Um, who, who, who owned some of those patents. And then it became pharmaceutical industry and they became cleverer and cleverer in the way they funded and operated the propaganda. And uh, a lot of it's done through the front groups, what you might call fake charities, um, where the, the CEO earns a million a year plus. So obviously not charities. The charities don't pay the CEO a million a year, a million bucks a year plus. That's it's just not done, is it? And they have a board of directors, often more than 100, 120, something like that. Again, that's a very unusual feature because it's just not needed in, in any kind of normal business or um, charity operation. And the reason they have that number of directors is a lot of those people are being paid off for previous services rendered um, while in government employment as regulators. What happens is they, they run what's called the non-executive director ploy. And so when a regulator from, for example, the CDC retires, um, they take on a job as a non-exec director with one of these American body part associations and they get a, a monthly fee for doing nothing, which is a thank you for what they did while they were with the CDC. So, and that's the revolving door, you know, and kind of how it works. And 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 so, um, the you know, I, I I've heard of it recently. I became familiar with a tactic um, that uh, I can't remember the author's name, but he points out the way that that some of these groups and what the real motive behind these these groups. Why would there be this revolving door? Well. The idea is, 
Um, you get a, f- a person friendly with a certain, you know, corporation or corporate group, for instance, a big tobacco, a uh, big tobacco or big pharma, get them into a regulatory position, crush the industry through regulation. And then just before they leave office, they release the regulation or they create loopholes that are only obvious to the people riding the bill so that they can now go to the private sector and, cre- you know, basically pick up the pieces of the regulation and then essentially own that market. Are you familiar with that type of tactic? Have you ever heard of that type of thing? Yeah, as you say, it's called a revolving door system. And um, the, the, the reason it operates is because these days you can't pay uh, somebody uh, uh, directly while they're working for you uh, in, in government service. So in the old days, they used to get what we call a bung in England, B-U-N-G, a bung or a brown envelope, which is just a pile of cash in an envelope. Well, that can't be done now and you can't transfer it to to a bank, uh, even to an offshore bank. It gets difficult because there's a paper trail. So what they do is they work on a promise and um, what these people do is they work to, for example, farmer's agenda while they're in government employ. And then when they leave, they get their reward then. And you see that all the way through the strata of employment um, from uh, mid, mid-ranking regulators right up to premier country, premiers of countries. So when you see, for example, an ex-president or an ex-prime minister or um, chancellor or the head of the treasury go on a speaking engagement and getting paid 200,000 bucks for a speaking engagement. He's not being paid for that speech. He's being paid for the work he did for the industry while in government employment. Yeah, we're seeing, and we see that uh, quite obviously with, you know, even uh, our United States presidential candidates, obviously Hillary Clinton is an example. And then as soon as Obama left office, he's doing half a million dollar speeches for the banks that he bailed out, you know, and so it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, you know, but what's interesting is that, uh, uh, the Royal college of physicians in the UK has been very vape friendly and have been able to avoid that type of corruption, or maybe I'm not familiar with a story where they have been corrupted. So what do you think is uh, is the difference between U.S. and U.K. politics in regards to vaping and propaganda? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and the answer to that is very simply money. The money supply in the USA is about 10 times the size. In some areas, it'd be five times the size or 20 times the size. So we they simply don't have the money here. Um, to fund the corruption to the same level. So um, I'm afraid, you know, you could say, well, our academics are more honest or they're better or they're better scientists or whatever, but I'm a bit of a cynic. And um, my answer would be there simply isn't enough money. So there's enough money to pay for some. And we have um, uh, some academics making a lot of noise about vaping, against vaping. And you can see the connection runs uh, through about three levels. It's pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company pays the university and the university, so the funds are greenwashed, and then the university pays the academic to speak um, against vaping, which is what farmers are asked for. So the, that's quite rare because the money just isn't there over here in the UK. Um, and so you, you've you've got a situation where the academics aren't being paid um, to the same extent to work against THR solutions, against vaping, whatever. Um, whereas in, in the USA, the money supply to fund anyone who will work against vaping by um, producing um, media content or by producing junk science, um, that, those funds are enormous. You know, the, the funds for junk junk science are just eye-watering from $850,000 up to $3.5 million just for one study, as long as, it, um, as long as it's against vaping. That's what they'll get paid. 
Right. Um, I have a couple questions about that, but I mean, what, what uh, one of the arguments I heard about the, the vape friendly environment in the UK is that, you know, the socialized medicine and the fact that, you know, it's publicized. And do you think that's a factor where there is actually an incentive to, to, to really introduce a, 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 an actual, um, you know, viable solution to smoking because the public is involved with the funding of, of healthcare over there? Or do you think that's not really much of a factor? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's a big factor because um, this, this uh, topic area is kind of separate from, it's public health and it's not really, public health isn't connected with um, the, the general health services here. It's a different, it's a different thing. See, public health is an industry. Uh, it, it has two separate components, the street level um, operation, which is carried out by uh, doctors, midwives, um, health clinics, um, uh, uh, care of babies, um, vaccinations, that kind of stuff. That's street level public health. And then you, uh, 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 a considerable distance away from that, right up at the top, you've got the national level uh, public health industry, which does no physical work. It, has no, it, does, it doesn't do anything practical in a way of public health. All it does is create um, policy and media content. Now that public health industry is huge everywhere because there's so much money in it. I mean, even in uh, little countries like like the UK, there are um, three or four national public health associations, um, uh, not just for the, the individual countries, and so. Um, they're getting their funding from somewhere. There's a lot of it. They have to do something. And uh, this is smoking is a prime area where they can um, they can work in and produce content and justify their salaries. So there's an industry there. It has to do something. They're getting paid. They get it. They get paid extremely well. They're getting they're getting paid. Um, at the top of that game, they're getting paid something like £100,000 a year, which is a lot of money for the UK. It's maybe 140000 bucks a year. And that's big money for um, government employees and public, um, public uh, organisation employees over here. So they've got to find something to do. And um, so what they do is produce new policy for... Uh, obese kids or um, kids with asthma or uh, soda pop, you know, what, what do you call it? So there's a, a fizzy pop um, drinks, how to reduce the sugar in that, uh, reducing the smoking. Of course, reducing smoking, uh, that kind of ceased to work in 2008 when we got to um, about the 20 percent prevalence point, because in a developed Western country, you're not going to get below twenty percent um, smoking prevalence by using tr traditional methods. Um, uh, the only thing that will uh, chop it after that is THR, the THR approach. So, from 2008 to 2013 in the UK, smoking prevalence jammed up at twenty percent. No matter how much they spent, no matter how much noise they made. Uh, and in some cases, all of the lies they, they uh, came out with because they were continually claiming that they were reducing smoking prevalence, but it stayed locked at 20% from 2008 to 2013. And in 2013, the vaping effect started to take, uh, take place and then smoking prevalence started to drop away again and it's come down to somewhere around 15% or something now. And that's all due to vaping. And if you look at the numbers, the number of vapors equals the number of people that quit smoking, more or less. It's more or less exactly the same. So, uh, in that case, almost you just got lucky that you know they had to support their their agenda, and they actually did see that you know vaping was helping with smoking. And so, it's almost like they, you know, if they would have found a way to keep lying, maybe they wouldn't have been so favorable to vaping. But in this case, they kind of it sort of the cards fell in our favor in that way. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, that's that's one of the factors. It, it, it's true. There are a couple of honest guys over here, a couple of honest people. Um, there's 
Professor John Britton, the head of the um, tobacco group in the Royal College of Physicians. Now he's um, an honest guy. He hasn't taken the money and just um, um, dumped on vaping. Um, he, he can see that if you analyze the uh, components and there's really nothing in there that's going to compare with tobacco smoke. So tobacco smoke is 9,600 separate compounds identified so far in tobacco and tobacco smoke. So that'll go to about 10,000 or more. Whereas the most you could get from uh, analyzing uh, vapor is about 150 separate uh, compounds. And even that would have to come from a very complex flavor. Normally, it would be around 100. So uh, it's very much simpler to analyze the content of uh, vapor. And it's uh, basically innocuous. I mean, um, PG, propylene glycol, has been um, used and investigated for 70 years. It's been uh, used in, in for medical purposes for 70 years. And now... Um, uh, they're, they're, the, the big manufacturers are trying to get their clients to change to a synthetic glycerol. And so uh, the, if the pharmaceutical manufacturers are telling their industrial clients to change their inhalers, asthma inhalers and so on, from PG to synthetic glycerin, then Clearly, there can't be too much in the way of danger in, in implicit in that. So um, most of these things are um, either absolutely harmless, reasonably harmless, or um, acceptably safe. Uh, GRAS, generally recognised as safe. So there's, there's nothing really to get excited about in, um, in vapour unless you... Um, cook the vaporizer and, and drive it way too hard and then you will get thermal breakdown products in the vapor and then you can produce junk science that says vaping is dangerous look at what we found right all, all that stuff's been torn apart by the scientists because it's just it's basically blatant lies which is the no, the number one you know the only the only scientific study that they could the anti vapors can really stand on is the one that said, well, there's all these different compounds when you vaporize through the coils. But what the reality is that that those tests were done in environments where vapors just wouldn't have even inhaled that because it's just beyond the actual operating, even the operating ability of most vaping devices. So it just uh, falls apart pretty quickly. Unfortunately, that that type of science doesn't get as much publicity because there's not the money behind it. Um, so I wanted to go behind back to what you were saying about sort of these paid experts and how they actually work in, you know, the way that they funnel the money in through the universities so that you have these, you know, supposed, you know, experts that are saying X, Y, Z about vaping. And obviously the biggest example in the United States is Stan Glantz, sort of the, uh, the, the, the enemy number one for vaping. Um, do you have any information about Stan Glantz or even a similar uh, scientist that has rented his credibility out to the anti-vapors in exchange for funding for the university or otherwise? Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, um, Mr. Glantz is, is an interesting case. and um, um, I'm an admirer of, of his in, in, in uh, at least one respect. Um, he he, according to figures um, released by Brad Rodu, he earns he, about $6 million a year pass over his desk. So he's um, reasonably well funded. And I, I doubt very much that whether that would be um, the, the entirety of his funding. I would imagine it would be something like double that. Um, and so he's in an excellent position to... Um, create junk science and to find um, partners to work with and also to uh, for other people who want to get into that um, uh, line of business to, to get in touch with him and, and work with him to produce um, stuff that attacks vaping. Now, it, it's hard to say um, exactly what his uh, personal motives are, but I, I think that he, he actually believes uh, what he says about it, it, um, 
him believing that uh, vaping may be harmful. He probably believes that. But I, I'm an admirer of his because uh, he's the, the finest person in the world I've ever come across um, a rhetorical fallacy, logical fallacy in, in debate and argument. He is, his brain's wired differently to, any, to other people's. He, he, when he speaks and argues um, in, in debate, he automatically um, uses a rhetorical fallacy mode, which is, it, it's very difficult for other people to, you know, you can get statesmen like Winston Churchill or whatever who, who, who managed to do that kind of thing by artifice, uh, by, by uh, um, being very clever and um, uh, being scholars as well as debaters. And, and but but um, uh, Mr. Platts is different. He's he's hardwired to think and speak in terms of logical fallacy. That's what he does, and um, that's why it's impossible for scientists to, to debate with him because he turns science into a into a kind of quagmire, a bog that you sink into, and it, it's impossible to argue with him because he's just so incredibly clever with um, rhetorical fallacy. In other words, everything he says has a grain of truth in it, but it also um, is, is not true. So um, he has the ultimate skill in that line. I've never seen anybody who's as good at, uh, as good at that as, as he is. And um, I, I, frankly, I admire that because he, he, he's, he's, he's a genius at that particular um, aspect of it and and that's what brought him to the notice of the pharmaceutical industry and the, the tobacco control industry the public health industry in the first place that yeah incredible talent that um debate by by taking what is not true and making it appear to be true and so um he's essentially impossible to debate because he's just so good at it Yes. Uh, and it's, you know, the, it's the height of selfishness and the height of, uh, you know, hypocrisy. But, you know, if he hits that six million dollar check, it doesn't matter to him where it comes from. And he doesn't care how many lives he destroys about it. And, you know, it's very egocentric and egotistical. But uh, that's that against. And so, you know, I've never personally heard him speak. I'd be interested in if you know of any speeches I could listen to. I'd love to hear it. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's just sad because, you know, what what the, one of the things that you mentioned in your article on Quora, your answer on Quora is, um, by the way, the link, the name of the question that you answered is what is a powerful propaganda technique? And I thought thought your answer was was incredibly um, uh, useful and, and very well thought out. But you mentioned astroturfing and John Oliver just did a little piece on astroturfing, by the way, on his show on HBO. I've heard of astroturfing before through a TED talk that I listened to. Um, for people who don't know, astroturfing is when they are able to corroborate their bullshit um, through different sources so that if you were to say, listen to, um, let's say, listen to this interview, and then you go and Google, um, you know, what is propaganda? And then that first result that comes up is like, you know, the exact thing that corroborates what we're talking about. And they're like, okay, well that seems to make sense. And they go to social media and they start talking about their, um, it's with their friends and they realize, Oh, all these other people are saying the exact same thing. And so I did my research and I concluded that what I believe is true. And so therefore, you know, this scientific article that they're referencing must be also true. And that's, but, but what, what really happens is that's all made up. It's all fake. It's all either crowdsourced through internet trolls, paid trolls, um, or, you know, unknowing zealots that actually believe it. And uh, that's how it all works. And so, you know, talk about astroturfing and how good they are doing this. And then, you know, how do you even fight against it to, be, to begin with? Yeah, astroturfing, a definition of that is to create what looks like a grassroots uh, community or public um, movement when in fact it's paid for or started by industry. So um, it's called AstroTurf because it looks like real grass, grassroots, but it isn't, it's synthetic. So uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to beat because um, the media, uh, the media like the money that they're paid by their advertisers 
pharma advertising is big business, and so they can't afford to um, they can't afford to hurt them and uh, stop that revenue stream. So uh, the media will uh, print and broadcast what the astroturf is saying. It's um, because it all looks good. Uh, yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah, and um, it's it's pernicious. It's incredibly effective. Um, and uh, you know, I I don't know of a way to really more astroturfing. I mean, have you thought about ways to 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 combat that or to at least stop it out, but either before it gets going or while it you know before it gets too big? Um, you can't stop it. What you have to do is combat it. So. Um, I did a PDF on um, my website, ecigarettepolitics.com, on uh, ways the community can fight um, a, a, a well-funded um, effort to destroy vaping. And so you can find that PDF there. I'll just uh, dig up a link for it, if I can. Yeah, we'd love, we'd love to share that because, you know, they're just getting to the point where we need to really – uh, start looking at, you know, we have to start far, fighting fire with fire. Um, you know, even just going to these city council meetings, which I've been to a few, they are not very well attended, but they get, they get, the, they get their, uh, they, they usually get their ordinance through the flavor ban is the, you know, the flavor of the week, no pun intended right now. Everybody's doing a flavor ban. There was one in San Ramon, a city that's near where I live right now. Um, and you have these obviously either paid or completely unaware people that are spreading this BS. And, you know, I have a very strong suspicion that these people are paid because paid protesters are very common. And they, they go up there and they say the exact same BS talking points that we hear all the time. And then they just leave. They're not a concerned citizen. They're not a soccer mom as they appear to be. They're not a concerned high school student that watched their friend become addicted to nicotine through vaping and there's even some unbelievable propaganda that i saw in the beverly hills uh you know city council meeting some guy saying that these these nicotine uh the, the jewel things just causing people to become total burnout losers and I mean, it's it's actually impressive the type of stuff that they're getting people to say. But in John Oliver's piece, I recommend you watch that. It's on YouTube right now. He totally points out that there's groups called, uh, you know, it's called crowd uh, crowds on demand, and they'll pay up to two hundred dollars for people to go say anything that they want. They usually pay, you know, uh, old actors or out of work actors that yeah, uh, get, uh, crowds of kids with the uh, posters, don't you? That's one. Yeah, I mean, you give me two hundred dollars, I'll say whatever you want. I don't care, you know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that's okay, how it works. Link, I got a link for you here. How can I post that? Well, uh, if you post it in the chat, I'll post it. Uh, I'll repost it where wherever we're streaming right now. Okay, in the chat. All right. So there you go. That's a page with um, a brief PDFs on um, sort of stuff from. Um, Clive Bates and uh, some stuff from me on um, community uh, resistance to uh, industry attacks. Oh, Clive Bates. What a great hero he is. I love Clive. Yeah. Um, and so this is supposed to be going over. I'm looking at the one that says vape briefing. Is that the one? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, so you've got uh, some information on astroturfing in here. If you if you look on um, the second one down, the vaping advocates rules for campaigning, it's for community activists, and it's got some um, outline points on what you're going to face and how you can uh, help to counter that those problems. Oh, interesting. Okay, this is very useful stuff here. Yeah, you know there is a lack of knowledge on how to actually engage the city council and to have a compelling argument because the, you know, a lot of people just go up there and they're very passionate. I've seen a lot of vape shop owners go up there and, and just not have a very coherent argument prepared and a lot of rambling and quote of ranting and raving. 
And I, I understand the passion and I understand why they're doing it because obviously their business is being threatened and they're all a lot of times have a personal story about vaping that's very close to them, but it's just not effective. Um, I was able to go up there and I quite honestly believe that uh, my testimony was very effective because I pointed out quite honestly that quite obviously too, that these people that were writing this legislation in San Ramon particularly, they were not sampling the science fairly. And they were not giving any of the positive vaping studies a fair chance. And all they had to do was point that out to the city council. And they were actually very receptive, receptive, luckily and shockingly, to this idea. Look, there's absolutely no science referenced in support of vaping yet. There's, I think there's got to be a hundred now, at least. There's probably hundreds of studies that you could point to that at least corroborate the idea that vaping is clearly less, less dangerous and clearly a good option for current smokers. Um, and that simple fact of just pointing out the science actually, I think swayed the city council. So it, it, I think if anybody's listening to this and you have a flavor ban happening in your city, or you're going to be uh, fighting the city council for any type of ordinance, then this is a very good document to read. And I'll post the link in the chat. So, um, have you have you had to personally be involved in any battles locally or is it pretty quiet for you? And, and you know, it's interesting, by the way, that you are in the UK and you're so involved with the US politics. Um, you know, tell me about why you're so involved with us <laughs> other than maybe the fact just that, you know, it's such a big market. But I would like to hear that. Yeah, it's because of crap overflow. You know, um, we're, we're only a little tiny place and um, we get uh, just trampled on by the huge volume, the power of whatever comes from the USA. And so um, we're lucky we've got a lot of honest academics here. So that's the foundation that we're able to operate with. For example, Public Health England, um, they, um, they recognize that uh, the THR approach is the best way to reduce smoking prevalence after a certain point. And my, my opinion is that point is 20% prevalence. And so, so we have that foundation, but all the time we're being attacked in the media uh, because of the money that's available to do that and because of the overflow from the USA, because anti-vaping is a giant industry in America. And so that, you know, we have to deal with that over here because it's it's a problem for the whole of the rest of the world. The, 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 the problem is the size of the smoking economy. It's, uh, I, I estimated about one and a half trillion dollars a year, 1.5 trillion a year. If you think about that, that size of sub economy, a lot of it is uh, centered in the USA. It is an enormous, enormous industry with so many tentacles, so many partners. Um, you think of all, all the people that gain from it, the government in tax revenues, the states in tax revenues, the states in MSA funds, enormous funds go to the states. I mean, they, they fund, I'm told they fund things like the staff pensions, for the MSA funds. And, uh, uh, of course, it's supposed to go to um, um, anti-smoking um, initiatives. But, of course, it, once it's, the money's in, their, uh, in the state bank, then um, it just gets used for whatever. So are, are you familiar mm -hmm. with um, how the MSA funds work? Actually, I was, I was looking, very curious. I had only re really recently learned about the MSA, which is the Master Settlement Agreement, correct? that uh, was reached actually fairly recently, it seems like, about um, you know, where, what the tobacco companies are supposed to be, are, are responsible for in, in terms of their effect on public health and how those, the taxes that they're being taxed are supposed to be allocated. And so I would love to hear more about how that all works. And I th think people definitely do not understand the implications of the Master Settlement Agreement. And I think if they did, first, of all, they would hopefully be more skeptical of any type of government intervention in the marketplace, but also they clearly see where the motivations are for all of the stuff that we're talking about today. So yeah, tell us about the MSA exactly. and how it all works. 
you, 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 the first thing you've got to understand is a huge amount of money. It, uh, it's going to be more than, I think, I mean, this is, I'm in the UK, I'm talking about USA, so it's not, it's not um, in my backyard. But um, I've had to learn about this because, you know, this stuff overflows on the whole of the rest of the world. So we, we've had to cope with it. Now, as I understand it, the total MSA funding will amount to more than $200 billion by 2022 or something. So it's just an enormous amount of money. And that money gets paid by the cigarette trade to the, directly to the states. There's, um, I think it's 49 of them signed up to the MSA, and there's one or two that didn't. Um, Florida maybe didn't sign up. But... Um, that's, that's a hell of a lot of money. So every, every year, those states get billions from the cigarette trade. That money just goes straight into the bank. Okay, now it's supposed to be allocated to anti-smoking initiatives, but of course it, it's um, allocated to everything, including the um, attorney general's, general's salary. Now, an attorney general in a US state earns a lot of money. Part of his income, part of his or her income, comes from the MSA funds. So they are they are bound up in ensuring the MSA funds keep being paid. the The only way the MSA funds will be paid is if people continue to smoke. That's what pays the MSA funds. It's just a, another a tax of 10 cents per pack on cigarettes or whatever it is. So, um, the, the, and, and because of the tax revenue the states get, the MSA funds that the individual states get, it's very, very important for states to ensure that smoking isn't threatened. Now, you, apparently you've got um, things they call over there the death spiral states like California, which are so badly financially managed that they're kind of disappearing down their own plug hole and they, they owe billions or trillions or whatever it is and they're never going to be able to pay it. Now, what um, states that were uh, really badly managed like that did was they sold their future MSA fund income as bonds. On the financial market. So what they did was they issued these bonds um, against future MSA income uh, to get the cash now. So they got paid when they needed the money uh, last year, year before, year before that, this year. They got paid. Now they've got to pay. Now, how are they going to pay those debts if the revenues from smoking reduce or disappear? How are they going to pay that? They can't, can they? So now uh, that makes complete sense. And by the way, that just knowing that, you know, it's hard for people to understand like, okay, I can understand why, uh, why the big pharma and big tobacco would be protective of the, of, of their interest in the, in this tobacco industry. But it's hard for people to understand why a government official, you know, who's supposedly working for the public, would be interested in, in, in raising taxes because, um, you know, doesn't taxes don't necessarily always go to, you know, one person or another. They usually put into a big fund or whatever. But in this case, the MSA money does go directly to some government employees. And so there is a very big incentive for them to keep their salaries. And so that's always not mentioned in any of the conversations that we hear, especially in, in the media and all everywhere. Um, but what I what I wouldn't understand actually about that is is why ban a flavor if they know that if the it's already being taxed like a cigarette and if more people like flavors then wouldn't they have the incentive to keep flavors around? I mean, aren't those two kind of competing ideas? Why would they ban flavors if they want the tax money? Um, flavors are just um, a red herring in 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 cigarette sales. Um, you know, uh, what percentage of uh, tobacco cigarettes are flavoured? Well, you've got um, menthol, uh, which is often safe because they won't touch menthol because it, as you say, it brings in the tax dollars. 
And uh, you've got very small market sectors like um, the Indonesian clove cigarettes, that kind of stuff. So um, in, in, in the mainstream cigarette market, flavors are just a red herring. But where it, it, it was really painful is in vaping and in um, oral, some kind of oral tobaccos. And they, they don't really like oral tobaccos because there is a chance that somebody might uh, switch from smoking to oral tobacco, ST, smokeless tobacco. So they don't like that. So that's essentially why they're going to attack flavors. So, because, uh, you know, we see a lot of, obviously, San Francisco uh, just passed what they passed, Beverly Hills just passed what they passed, and the, the, the supporters of it, um, you know, they they like to use, you know, one of the, one of the groups likes to use minority, uh, you know, sort of identity politics to say we're saving black lives by by banning, you know, the flavors or the menthols that that um, our black citizens like to smoke, which seems very um, obviously. I mean, it's just it's just silly on its face. But um, you know, it is it is. Are those are those groups that are you know calling it a black tax and things like that, are they involved and then getting money from the same places as the propaganda that we're seeing, for instance, about protecting the kids from the flavors or are they actually different and they're actually competing? I mean, cause to me, I still think the incentives are, are, are competing with each other because if I really do want that tax money to come in and flavors and to, and vaping is this booming industry. Well then, I want flavor. I want as many flavors as we can get. And so how do you reconcile that sort of, I feel like that's a, that's inconsistent. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Um, nothing's ever going to earn as much money as, as smoking the cigarette sales because um, it, the money, the value of smoking is in the harm that it does. Okay. Smoking has no, would have, little or no value, very little value, if it didn't do any harm. You know, tobacco is a very cheap product. I don't know what the cost of a, a, a packet of cigarettes with with no taxes, um, but it would be, if it was just uh, subject to normal tax, a, a pack of cigarettes would be, what, 90 cents or, or 75 cents or a dollar 10 or something. So but what is it now, a pack of cigarettes? Uh, I don't know here, but over here it's like approaching ten pounds, which would be fourteen dollars a pack, something like that. Yeah. So that's that's ninety-five percent tax. So that is the the value of smoking, the huge amount of tax revenue that it generates. And then you've got more channels, revenue generating channels, all the way down the line. You've got the tax at the front on the front end, then you've got uh, the drugs to treat smoking with. Enormous, enormous money on it. You think about uh, the cost of one course of chemotherapy for cancer in the USA. The average cost is twenty-seven thousand dollars. That is one treatment, one course of treatment. <laughs> Uh, you know, could, that income, when that revenue, when it's totaled up, you know, that's more than the GDP of a small country. It's an enormous amount of money. That's where the value of smoking is. It's not in the, the value of the product. The value of smoking is in the harm that it causes. So uh, when you've got uh, cancer treatment, one treatment average, $27,000, and that's an average. So it's, it's possible that some of the smoking cancer treatments will be more than that. And then you've got several treatments before the patient dies, and you've got to multiply that by hundreds of thousands or millions every year. That's an enormous amount of money. And then you're only talking about one disease there. You, so you've got cancer heart problems, cardiac problems, vascular problems, so cardiovascular problems. You've got um, diabetes, 40% of diabetes sufferers are smokers apparently or something like that. So it, it gets a huge boost from smoking. High cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, um, uh, emphysema, lung problems, mm -hmm. it's all drugs. 
it's all a huge pile of very expensive drugs. So you find that um, where you can get access to the numbers, like in the UK, pharma earns 1.5 to twice as much. That's 150 to 200% from smoking as the tobacco industry does. Okay, I, in case that I didn't get that over the first time around, the pharmaceutical industry earns as much as twice as much from smoking as the cigarette trade does. So it's an enormous amount of money, and that's where the value of smoking is. Now, if you look at a socialized state such as the UK, you've got front end and back end earnings for the government. So on the front end, the government is tobacco. The two places in the world where government is tobacco, and that's the UK and China. Um, in China, it's because government um, owns, essentially owns all the resources, the manufacturer, the, the, the farming, the manufacturer, the distribution, it's all government owned or um, farmed out to um, uh, industries that the government owns. In, in the UK, it's down in money. Um, on, the cigarettes have a very high tax um, applied to them. And 86% um, of the OTC uh, cost, over-the-counter cost, the retail cost of cigarettes is tax. So the, the government make 86% of that uh, over-the-counter cost on tax. Now that's just the front end. On the back end, this is a socialized state, so um, it's generally claimed by um, these um, that group of people that um, smokers die on average 10 years early. So perhaps it only might be eight years early, or perhaps it can't be calculated at all. But um, it's reasonable to assume that smokers on average die earlier than the general population. Now, they claim smokers die, die 10 years early. Now, look at a situation where every single adult uh, over 65 is paid a pension, okay? And every single person gets free health care on the state. And every single person gets uh, social support for seniors. So if they have to go into a care home or when they're old, perhaps with dementia, then the state takes care of that. So if you remove... 10 years of someone's life at the most expensive time of their life when they're earning a pension they have extremely expensive health care compared to young people it's something like 10 times as much and all the social support for uh, uh, senior citizens that that the, the money that saves is almost equivalent to the tax revenue generated on the front end so they have front end earnings back-end savings. In the middle of that, they've got all the other channels um, connected with cigarette sales. Um, tax revenues from logistics, retail, distribution, um, pharmaceutical industry, uh, an almost endless number of channels. So in the UK, government is greater than a 90% stakeholder in cigarette sales. It's, it's a little bit higher than that. But whatever way you, you, you run the numbers, they're, they're bigger than 90% stakeholder in tobacco. So that's not something you're going to read anywhere. But it's very important because government has a huge stake in protecting cigarette sales. It's as simple as that. Hmm. Uh, it's a messy situation. Uh, I, I've been following, you know, I've got, we've got some, a lot, a lot of fights coming up, especially uh, locally. If you are locally listening to this in the U S you absolutely have to be paying attention to this stuff and you have to absolutely um, watch out for your local city council and listen to Chris and read these articles and um, subscribe to his blog. Uh, where can they find you by the way, before I ask my final question? Okay, it's in that link that I gave you, ecigarettepolitics.com. And you can also go to quora.com. Let's put that up in the chat as well, because um, I've written a load of stuff there. So, uh, Yeah, you, good... uh, you have over 3,000 answers on Quora, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah. 
So um, it's not the only subject I write on. I'm interested in um, engineering, long distance sailing, and uh, coach boxing. I coach uh, type of bare knuckle boxing. So um, I'm interested in various things. So uh, it's vaping advocacy is just one of them. But you can find me on Quora and on uh, my vaping site, userpolitics.com. Awesome. Um, uh, so I just want to ask, you know, what what's next for you in the next, next few years? Are you working on any projects we should know about? And uh, what uh, how can we support you? Well, I'm currently writing a book on uh, practical boxing, but I guess you, you that's kind of street boxing mixed with ring boxing. But I guess you're not really going to be interested in that. Um, <laughs> uh, vaping wise, <laughs> sounds um, interesting. Vaping wise, I'm one of the old school now. Um, you can tell that by what I vape. I'll show you here. It's a 510 atomizer. You probably don't even know what that is. Oh, actually, I am familiar with that. I had one myself for a while. Um, I moved on to uh, another controversial one. I'm I'm on a smock priv, uh, uh, X priv, which you know people give a, a smoke or a smock. I like to say smock anyway. They give it a lot yeah. of crap, but man, I love this device. It's really amazing. So, yeah, my um, lungs but, can't take my lungs can't take that volume of vapor anymore. So I just uh, have to chill it out a bit. You know. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, Hey, well, Chris, I appreciate the time, um, the knowledge. I hope to have on you, have you on again. If there's any developments we want to pick your brain about, um, I think you're clearly a leader in the way that the propaganda is working in the vape industry, and it's been fascinating to talk to you, man. So thanks for your time. Yeah, you're welcome, Jesse. I'm, I'm uh, glad I could help. All right.